Welcome to Between the Covers, the show for readers, writers, and lovers of books. I'm Stephanie, and I'm a publisher at Red Penguin Books, where we publish books and authors of all types and genres. So if you have a book in your head, a manuscript ready to go, or maybe even 300 sheets of loose leaf shoved in a drawer. And yes, at least once a month, we get loose leaf sent to our office. Visit us at redpenguinbooks.com and unleash your inner author. I'm so thrilled to be joined by three authors today from all over the world who have absolutely unleashed themselves. Um, today on the show, we have um, Joanne Brock, author of Nine Month Temptation and many other romantic novels that you're just going to love to meet. And um, Anthony Tonelli, author of Legacy, which is book one in the Dominion series. That's a hint, there's more to come. And Kevin Albin, the author of Stone Child. This is quite the interesting story, and I'm so thrilled that Kevin is joining us today from Tours, France. So, Kevin, you have to start us off today and tell us a little bit about Stone Child. Just the description itself was was absolutely fascinating. So, can you give mm. us a, a a little a little synopsis without? Um, I'll say without spoilers. Without, without, that's it, without giving away too much. Exactly. Yes, it, it's magical realism. Uh, so it, it, it works, it's not magic as in Harry Potter, but magical realism as in it's not really true, but it's got a message behind it. So it starts with the Houses of Commons, that's the, the Parliament in the UK, and the statue of Sir Winston Churchill, where every all the ministers walk, uh, or the members of Parliament walk past the statue and touch his foot for good luck. And on this occasion, uh, the member of Parliament for Oldham reaches out to touch his foot and the statue moves his foot away. And that's how it starts. There's pandemonium, of course, and the bodyguards for the prime minister come in with guns drawn and they, they escort him out and, and, and no one can understand what's happening. And in a nutshell, the, uh, the deceased, if you like, the famous deceased of London, have abled, are able to have contact in the present world through the embodiment of their statues. And normally, as the book describes, they would be just listening to the world go by. But on this occasion, because the world is in such danger, because of climate change and biodiversity loss and everything else, they've, they've agreed to come to life to give us a message. And, and that's the synopsis of the book. So that's, that's them coming to life with their message. Molly Hargreaves, a 15-year-old young girl living in London who has got an interesting background of how she was raised and other bits and pieces, doesn't believe their benign message. She thinks they're up to no good and she sets out on a mission around London where in fact she's chased, she's captured, she has clues to solve, um, to prove that the statues are not who, you know, they don't come with that that benign message that they, they claim that they have. And of course, it, it culminates in an enormous battle between statues and the police. And, you know, and as a police officer, as an ex-police officer, in fact, how do you shoot a statue that's made of stone and metal? You know, how are we gonna win this battle? And, and, that, and that's the book. So the book is very much a, a ripping yarn as it's been described but it also has some messages behind it to do with conservation, but also some of the issues that teenagers, adolescents go through. It questions those things to do with how society lives its life, but in a fun way, I hope. Love that. And uh, my daughter went to school in London. So I've spent quite a bit of time in London. And when, when I saw your book, I was remembering walking past all of those statues thinking, ooh, what if? <laughs> That's it. That's it. What if, you know, and um, a very night at the museum kind of uh, esque that we have here in the States. Uh, yeah, so someone, someone once described it as Dan Brown meets museum in a, in a, oh, okay. a, in a museum. Oh, okay. That museum. That sort of thing. So cool. it's, and, and then how it came about, Stephanie, was that I was actually working as uh, on a corporate development program as a facilitator, in fact, and we were in London. And one of the clues was based around the statue, the Royal Tank Memorial statue. Um, and it was hot and I was tired and my back was aching and the clients were taking ages. And I just pictured 
the statue coming to life saying, come on, it's not rocket science, it's easy, just get it. <laughs> and that, that was the idea, that, that, that pinged an idea. And I thought, you know, why would they come to life? Well, they could come to life yeah. over concert. And, and the idea never left me. And, and, and away it went. Wow, I love that. And, you know, so many people say to me, gosh, I would love to write and I have no ideas. Where do I find an idea? And your, your story is just such a great example of the fact that the ideas are all out there. You just have to be receptive. And sometimes it's at the most unusual time. I don't know that you were walking around thinking, I need an idea for a novel. I mean, if you, I think if you walk around with that, with that uh, idea, if you walk around with that premise, it doesn't arrive. I think it, it often just pops into your head for, for no apparent reason. Absolutely. I, mean, I, I made a joke because in the book, the statues have a telepathy amongst themselves. That's how they communicate and plan and scheme. And I, uh, I've, I've made a joke in the past to say, I think it was the telepathy, it's the statue telling me to write this book. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my next question was, when you wrote it, did you know how it was going to end? Or did, were the statues talking to you, like many fiction writers will say? It, um, coming from a police background, I'm, of course, very methodical. And I used to work on murder incident rooms and serious crime. And of course, we, we're, we are very pragmatic about that. So back home, I had a big board on, on the wall with a with a map of London, I had files for all the characters. Uh, they, they, they became very real to me. They, they developed, I planned their routes. I did a lot of trips to London to work out, you know, if a statue, uh, what, what's the weight of the statue? What would be the damage to the road? How would he move from A to B? I, I worked out all of those logistics. But at the same time, I was creating the story as it unfolded, because standing in front of, say, uh, the statue of Wellington, for example, I, I could then see what he might do because of the position he was is. Right. He was in. And, and, and um, a good example of that was, was Boudica, or Bodicea, as some people call her. She's on a, on a big concrete plinth, and I pictured the the whole chariot and horses and her being dragged off onto the road and the damage it would cause and 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 the story just unfolded itself to me yeah, so. wow wow well that police background certainly came in handy didn't it <laughs> <laughs> is that something you use in other books too is that a plan <laughs> yes i think so i mean the the sequel is going to be in america that's uh the the, the first book finishes with a scene, a conversation between the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of the UK. And uh, that leads straight into book two, which is what I'm working on at the moment. Oh, fantastic. Well, uh, we're in America. Are we talking the statues in the Capitol area, the statues up in the New York area? Well, the, 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 con the conversation between the two is, uh, is about the Statue of Liberty and uh, who apparently has just gone missing. Oh. So that's, that's how it starts. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're also going to be studying, I'm sure, some history in order to be writing that. Uh... that that's right. And, then, and because the first book is, has got a lot of basis of history, it talks about the, the historical facts. And of course, when I published this, this came out when there was this, this drive of pulling down statues for various reasons. And of course, I want to look at American history. So I capture that sort of sentiment behind your statues, without a doubt. Interesting that you're, you're also in that, um, they, they call it here in America, the cancel culture of uh, getting okay. rid of the, the statues that are uh, less uh, you know, tasteful for today's uh, thought. But yes, sure. you'll have to study a lot of American history in order to do this next book. I have no doubt. Our next author also studied American history for his book. Uh, Legacy book, one of the Dominion series, um, focuses on a part of history and a kind of read on what might have happened during that part. Um, we of the Hamilton generation might think we know what happened there, but Anthony Tonelli is here to tell us what, what could have happened, let's say, in an alternate reality. Thank you huh. for joining us, Anthony. Glad to Thank have you here today. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. Um, yeah, this is a this is a book that I did. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a history major, and so that right off the bat was interesting to me. Um, the two uh, areas, the two things that have really, really fascinated me for years were science and history. 
Um, and I couldn't do the math to do the science that I wanted. Um, I was like, well, I'll either be an astrophysicist or a historian. Turns out you need a lot of calculus and stuff that I, I couldn't even pronounce some of these. <laughs> so I decided to go with history. Um, but what I did was I, I, I love science fiction. Like I love old school traditional science fiction, but there was, there's been a lot of that out there. So I decided, what if I do something a little bit different, right? And I said, what if I tell historical stories using certain real characters, but telling a sci-fi story with them? And so what I did was um, I came, I had this idea for a short story, actually, uh, about the, the, the birth of uh, the American Revolution. So my thought was, write a short story that kind of leads right up to the beginning of the uh, uh, revolution and then it and that would be the end of the story it was you know just an idea just to kind of say like this is how it actually got started so to speak and i was i started writing that uh, memorial day last year um and uh i wrote i wrote the entire short story i had it in my head so i wrote the entire it was like five thousand words something like and i wrote the whole thing in one day wow and so um, I've never had another 5,000 days since that, <laughs> since then, <laughs> um, those don't happen very often. Um, someone had my daughter, so she's very active. And so I was able to kind of concentrate on that. And I had the whole idea in my head. So I was like, Oh, okay, this is pretty cool. And I spoke to another author and he said, you know, um, unless you have like a really established name, a lot of people don't really follow like short stories like that because if Stephen King puts out a series of short stories, people will buy that because it's Stephen King. He goes, but uh, more people, they, they want to know more about what your writing style is. So it went from that to being developed into a full story. Right. And so um, the, the basis of the story is that historical figures were put in place uh, or actually were affected uh, uh, travelers, people who were, had the capacity to travel through time were actually put in specific circumstances. And the, the main character of the story is a guy named Cleon Strong, which is a, an anglicized version of his Greek name. Uh, his name in Greek is Cleisthenes. Um, for anyone who actually has, if you haven't studied history, uh, Cleisthenes was the man who invented democracy in Greece. He's the man that came up with the idea of one man, one vote. So who better to influence George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, so on and so forth. So I had this idea in my head, what if we took that guy who's the father of this, 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 you know, this thought process and have him directly inspire the American revolution. And so that was, like I said, that was the idea for the, uh, for the short story. And then once I had to develop it into a full story, I said, well, there's gotta be more dimensions than that. He can't do this by himself. There's gotta be, I can't write a full novel just based on his conversations because he doesn't speak to them very often. Every so often he communicates them. So he needed a liaison. So I created a couple of other characters. And um, because one of my biggest sci-fi influences ever was Rod Serling, uh, there's a whole bunch of plot twists, um, stuff that you know kind of surprises you and keeps the, the reader engaged. But the whole premise was that there's this organization uh, in the 23rd century uh, named the Dominion. It's a science uh, organization. And their whole reason for existing was to bring, uh, basically bring humanity forward, um, to, to, to illuminate the future for humanity. And uh, in order to do that, they, they understand people need to be free. So they, in this initial series, in the Dominion series, um, there are a number of uh, revolutions and, and nation building events that the Dominion directly takes part in by sending their agents, which are called operatives, they send their operatives back in time um, to these places to basically convince these leaders that they should lead these revolutions. Um, one thing that I learned from studying history is that a lot of people who ended up being leaders were reluctant leaders. Um, they believed in the cause, but they also knew this is dangerous. Um, when you have people that are very, very gung-ho, oftentimes they're not really thinking of the ramifications. Um, George Washington understood the ramifications. Um, he had been a, uh, a lieutenant in the, in the British Army. Uh, he was well aware of the military. At, at, at that time, in at the latter part of the 18th century, the British military was the biggest 
most powerful military in the world. So it was, it was a big undertaking for an upstart set of colonies um, in the new world. And so as the story begins to develop, uh, Cleon Strong needs to develop contacts and, and, and all that. And then something interesting happens. The machine that sent them there, it's called the console, uh, it stops working. So it, there's no way for them to get back. Right, nice. In the meantime, they still have a revolution that they've actually helped to start. Uh, so they kind of have to see that through and they hope that their team in the future will be able to figure this out um, before their luck runs out. Because um, as in any situation, any, you know, any uh, revolution like that, if the powers that be find out who you are, you don't get to finish your mission. So, <laughs> so they still have to be careful. They have to, uh, still have to be very stealthy. Um, but uh, Cleon, uh, actually, I, I did this because it was what I was familiar with. Um, both the stories in both centuries uh, take place in New York City. All right. Um, <laughs> I guess it. I grew up in, in Washington Heights, um, and there's a uh, there's a place there called a Morris House, the Jamel Morris House, um, and it was uh, originally owned by an English uh, captain, uh, named Captain Morris, um, and then eventually it was bought by the Jamel family. Uh, it still sits on 160th Street in Amsterdam, and um, I didn't know this. That's three blocks away from my house. I didn't know this, but for a six week period, George Washington used that as his headquarters. So I incorporated that into the story, um, even to certain dates. Like I was very specific about certain dates uh, because I needed to put the characters historically in the right context. They needed to be, in, in order for the story to be believable, they needed to be in the right place at the right time. So to say that Washington was in Delaware in late 76, that wasn't accurate. Right. Or you know, so, so I had to I had to follow that. I had to go with the uh, do a lot of historical research, kind of like the way Kevin did for 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 British history and, and stuff. Uh, and he's going to do now for American history. Um, I had to do a lot of the same. And one of the things that's really cool that someone like you or anyone that's familiar with New York would, would kind of appreciate is the way I described the city. I actually went through a lot of trouble to find out what New York City was like in 1775. Um, what was there, what were the landmarks, what the streets were. I found uh, a treasure trove of old maps uh, of the town so that when I described events, I was able to be, because I grew up, you know, I grew up in New York in the, in the 80s and 90s and stuff. So obviously it was very different from what was there before. Um, one, of the one of the things that I learned that I never realized was that I had always heard about King's College, you know, um, and I didn't realize that King's College is what is now called Columbia University. Oh, okay. This, I they, did not know this, that either. Yes, I just presumed um, it was in Brooklyn. No, no. Um, it was King's College. It was right next to Trinity Church in Lower Manhattan, right by uh, Wall okay. Street. And, um, and so I incorporated that into it. Now, part of what I really was able to have fun with is I was <clears> telling <throat> a couple of past histories because... Um, the characters from the 22nd century mm -hmm. were talking about a history that hasn't happened yet. They're right. talking about uh, a second American civil war, which took place uh, later in the latter part of the 21st century. Um, so obviously that hasn't happened. So I was able to create, not only was I able to retell an actual historical event, I was able to create a whole new history for the future of America. Absolutely. Uh, and having a character from the 23rd century tell that, in, in, in reverse um, was kind of cool because oh, please be kind to us in the future. <laughs> I, um, said, I said, please be kind to us in the future. You know, the, the, uh, the overall uh, uh, kind of big context of the story is that um, together we're better. All right. You know? I and, like together we're better. <laughs> and um, there, there's, uh, there's this, you know, we have, we have all this. I, I honestly, for a while, I actually stopped watching the news. I first, first of all, I didn't have time. <laughs> like, secondly, it was like so negative and stuff. And then, and then every once in a while, you know, poignant events kind of hit you. Like I said, I started writing the story on Memorial Day. Right, right. You know, and that was the day of, of George Floyd. So it's like, you oh. know, everything is just kind of tied in. And I said, you know, I, I need to write a story about you know, these people who are visionaries about what they wanted America to be, and then move it forward to what we, you know, how we can make it better. Um, 
So that's what the goal of the of the Dominion is. But needless to say, um, in a story like this, there's always there's obstacles. Always, there's always an obstacle. That's there's always obstacles. There's always um, so. Uh, when I wrote it, that's that's what I wrote in mind. And I didn't, honestly, like I said, I, I started the story as a short story. I was a professional wrestler for 11 years. Oh, and, wow. that's, and that's actually where I honed my storytelling ability. Because when we would do a match, we know what the beginning is. We have an idea what the middle is. And we knew what the end was. Um, so I kind of had those, at least two of those in my head. The finish was kind of fluid. Um, but everything else, we make it up as we go. And what I really found cool, and this is my first book, what I really found cool is how much I learned from the characters. After a while, the characters started telling me who they were. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has had that experience, but I thought it was like the coolest thing um, because uh, I would start typing out, you know, what I wanted them to say. And I would just keep going. And by the time I was done with, with, their, with their sentence or their paragraph or whatever, I was like, holy crap, I didn't realize that okay that's who he is all right good we'll go with that i liked it so we went with that so um it well, was uh it was an awesome process fabulous and you are my first wrestler to equate writing and story arc with wrestling i it, tell yeah. you <laughs> I, basically all i did was I, I i flipped the way it works in wow. wrestling we tell the story without any words gotcha it, it's all visual it's all physical Right in, right. in the book, we tell the story with no physical. It's all words and description. Mm -hmm. So I basically started telling the story the other way around, um, which actually, for me, it made it a lot easier um, because uh, I knew the part about, I, I knew how to tell a story without using any words. Now I was able to use words to really describe what I was, what I wanted to get across. Love it. Well, let's hope we have some other wrestlers out there who suddenly realize that they have skills that they can transfer to writing their next novel. <laughs> I think that's terrific. Our next author also is writing about New York. Um, in Nine Month Temptation, we uh, Anthony mentioned, there's always some sort of a problem. Well, the problem in this one is she's having a baby with her boss's brother. Uh, Nine Month Temptation by Joanne Rock also has an issue we talked about right before the show, affording an apartment in Manhattan and what that might do to your roommate situation. So Joanne, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I um, got the idea when my son was living in Brooklyn with complete strangers um, <laughs> in order to afford the place. And he lived in that situation for a while where you know a couple people would move out, a couple of other people would move in, but you know you had to have the quota in order to make your rent every month and I thought that's um, a really interesting way to uh, meet people to have a <laughs> new dynamic to try to get to know people that you don't know at all and try to work out um, work out things the, the basic things that come with living um, with other people and I also um, got the idea because I wanted all my heroines to live together. I wanted some sense of kind of girlfriend friendship, girl power taking place of young women starting out trying to make it on their own in the city. And I was inspired by um, the famous Barbizon Hotel okay. that uh, was in it was a New York City landmark for years and years. And it was set up so that young women could have a safe space that was all female, um, you know, sort of protected and uh, little rooms. It wasn't concentrated on a big glamorous living area. They just had a place to sleep, but it was a, a safe place to come back to at night. So the kind of grand dom, the woman who owns my Brooklyn apartment that she rents out to my heroines is somebody who lived in the Barbizon Hotel. And she always thought, I want to re recreate this, bring this back to New York City. And so she uh, takes resumes from women who want to get into careers in the city and picks um, promising prospects for people to have live there for a controlled rent. And then these young women are my heroines who try and navigate New York City, living with new people and, and of course, romance, because that's, that is my genre that I come back to again and again. Um, and Nine Month Temptation is a, is a surprise baby story that, you know, pregnancy that wasn't meant to happen, um, which is a kind of time-honored trope in romance. And the, the line that I write for Harlequin Desire, um, I've written many of them, like red spines up there are, are mostly Harlequin Desires. They're um, sexier stories and um, it's the 
friends to lovers, enemies to lovers, um, trapped together, yeah. situations that put couples in in um, close proximity or just, you know, way that they have to work through obstacles to reach their happily ever after. And I, I'm very drawn to romance. I've written many. Um, I think Nine Month Temptation is my 95th book. Wow. It's, it's a, you know, it's something that never gets old. It's it's not just boy meets girl. At its heart, it's a boy meets girl story, and we will be fascinated with that forever. Um, but underneath, it's also about relationships. The wonderful thing about romance is about teaching us to navigate relationships successfully, and not just romantic relationships, but friendships, the workplace, um, you know, kind of seizing your own sense of self, who you are, coming um, coming into your own, dealing with internal conflicts as much as, as external conflicts. And I really enjoy that. I find reading romance novels instructive, healing, and uplifting. They're, they're um, life-affirming, happiness-affirming. We know it's going to work out in the end, mm -hmm. um, it, which is kind of a safe space for the reader to work through problems, real problems that we have with our, with our parents, our, our own struggles, our, our romantic interest. So that's what fascinates me about romance. And I was very interested in both um, Kevin and Anthony's books talking about the historical aspect because I started out writing historical romance set in the medieval period. And I love, love the research. So I was really longing as I listened to both of you talk about your books, I was longing to go back to my reference shelf. I have so many history books and, and medieval atlases and, and things about medieval gardens and um, Oh, on and on. <laughs> and, and I love that. It's fun to kind of get lost in all of, in a different era and set the boy meets girl story, all the same things that we love about romance, but just set it in a different era and, um, and put in some of the historical characters and, and, uh, you know, follow what they were doing at the time so that it's accurate. You know, my, my English court is in the correct space that it really right. was in that year. All of that is important to me as well. I, I really, really enjoy historicals. Oh. I, I am so glad you said something that I've never heard a romance author say, and that was about um, the, like the safe space. I love reading romance. And when I'm watching television or, or movies, my kids know, don't give it to mom unless it has a happy ending. <laughs> it, that she just, I, and I always say, you know, life is dramatic enough. I don't need to be inundated with it on screen or anything else. I need to know that it, but I didn't realize, you know, kind of psychologically, I don't enjoy myself unless I know that I'm in a safe space. That was so clear to me when you said that. Well, and I, I found myself as a, re obviously I, I got into writing because I loved to read and I, I read a, quite a bit of romance before I started writing. Um, and this year, this crazy hard year that we have been through, I found myself reading so much more than ever. I, I was writing a lot, but I was also reading a lot because I needed that sense of, you know, must turn off the news, must go to a place where I know it can work out. You know, there are problems, but we'll get through them if we, you know, if we apply ourselves and, and work to better ourselves and understand each other. And these were messages that I, I needed emotionally. Uh, it was, it was good for me. And I, I enjoyed it. Absolutely. going to that because that's who we are as people we can work it out I, I'm a positive person I like to think if we work hard enough at our differences we we can find a way to get through them absolutely and the other thing you said you were talking about how romance books are are at their core about relationships but it, also about self-development in every great romance book you know of yours that I've read there's there's that aspect of a person who you know, they have to kind of fix themselves in order for them to, for the coupling to actually work. So there is a journey of their own, which is like, the world will be so much better if we can all, you know, fix ourselves and better together kind of a thing. I go back to um, when I was first learning to write, one of the things I enjoyed was, um, oh, Vogler's discussion of, of Joseph Campbell's hero of, with a thousand faces and the hero's journey and in a romance, there are two heroes and they're both on their own journey and they both need to come to that. You need to be able, as a hero, you need to be able to accomplish something at the end of the story that you couldn't accomplish at the beginning. That is your growth journey. And both both a hero and a heroine are on a growth track in, in a romance. So they're they're both coming to terms with who they are as people, how to be, how to be better people, how to strengthen themselves, how to overcome their flaws. 
Exactly. And, and you know, I, I love that because the focus really is on their journey. The other things, the apartment, the pregnancy, the job, you know, all of those things are part of the growth journey. And romance really, you know, shows that for the reader so that they, they grow themselves as they're reading. I think that's yes. fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> and and you, you get your inspiration now with, with this one. And I love where people get their inspiration because so many times, as I said, people, reader, writers say, oh, I wish I had ideas. Okay, you wrote 95 books. That's a lot of ideas. There is, there is an idea with every person that you meet. It, you know, I think as people talk about their journey and what they went through when they met their significant other or trials that they're having as a, as a parent, um, there's a story. There, there's a story in all of that because those things are what romance is concerned with, personal relationships. And, you know, for every friend that you have, every casual conversation you've struck up with a, you know, a stranger in the airport, um, you know, where you've learned interesting things about them, there, there's a story to be had in all of that. You just kind of need to have that writer's brain of grabbing the pieces. And, um, you know, you hear about this person's problem and think, well, I'm not writing a story about them. But, you know, what if she had been in this situation when that had happened to her, then, oh, then all hell would have broken loose. And then, and that's your story. When you, you have that situation and you put it in a real crucible and, and bring it to a crisis, that's when the story happens. Absolutely. You know, speaking with the three of you, um, some, some so common themes, Joanne, you were mentioning about the research and whether you're writing like Anthony and Kevin were um, books that are heavily researched because where they come from, or you're writing a romance you need to research. You need to, you know, people, we New Yorkers will know if you say something's on the wrong street. Yep. <laughs> or, you know, if you say that that hotel was open in this time period and we say, yeah, no, 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 you missed on that one. Or, or even just, you know, the hot dog stand on the corner. No, they've never been a hot dog stand on that corner. We would know with the romance. So, you know, with the, with the research. So there's the research portion, there's the, you know, igniting moment that all three of you had where, where this story just started to shake shape. And then there's the characters. And Anthony, I love that you were so um, dazzled since this was your first book. I know certainly it wasn't Joanne's first book, but I'm <laughs> sure her characters are speaking to her as well, right through her fingers. And uh uh, tell me, all of you, a time that maybe you were sitting there at the, the keyboard and writing and a character surprised you or you sat back and said, whoa, I didn't know that was going to happen. Did we ever have that kind of a, I didn't know we were going in that direction with this kind of a moment. My, my first book, it happened with two characters. Really? I actually had to change my villain at some point because the guy that I was writing as originally my idea for a villain, um, I ended up liking him so much. <laughs> Because, you know, um, he's a character named uh, Trujillo, and his biggest thing is he is painfully honest. He is straightforward. He's brutally honest. He has no filter. He doesn't care whether he hurts your feelings or not. And at first, I was like, well, that dude's like, you know, he can be really rude, really abrasive. But in the end, I found that that core of him that was just honest. And it wasn't always, he wasn't always bad towards people. He was honest and sometimes people didn't want to hear the truth. He didn't care. He was, he was, what you see is what you get. And so I was like, I, I can't, a guy who's like brutally honest like that. Yeah. I can make him seem abrasive, but I, he can't be the villain. How can we get mad at someone who's honest with us? You know? Um, so yeah, that, 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 that happened with that. And there was another character that, um, that I had to flip that. I was like, well, oh, he's like this benign older guy. And then as I started writing it, I'm like, well, what's his motivation here? And then I flipped those characters and one became the villain of the story. And the other one came, became one of the heroes of the story. That's, that's so fascinating. I'm sure people who haven't written yet are saying, I can't imagine that you didn't know who the bad guy was as you were writing the book and, and how exciting for you. That's, that's when writing the book is as exciting as reading the book. Right, right. And as a professional wrestler, it made sense to me. Um, how many bad guys have you seen become good guys? Like <laughs> every villain is a hero in his own story there exactly. we go there exactly. we go um, i remember i remember telling someone uh, my son actually we were talking and he was talking about like uh you know his, uh, 
traders in, in history and stuff. And he was doing a thing on school and, you know, just basically doing some research. And I said, you know, if you, if you look at the, you know, he was talking about like Benedict Arnold and, and, and George Washington. And I posed an interesting question to him. I said, you know, we as Americans, you know, we come down on Benedict Arnold. He joined the British army, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, both of them were subjects of the crown. They were both British. They were colonists, but they were both British. George Washington was a member of the British army and then led a revolt against it. Benedict Arnold went back to rejoin the army that he was rightfully a member of. So depending on who's telling the story, it'll tell you who the traitor was. Oh, absolutely. And, and isn't, uh, well, you're a historian, isn't history written by the winners? So Always. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that the way we view um, the American Revolution here in the States and the way they view it over in England are two very different slants on the same story. Yeah. That's for very, sure. Very true, very true yeah. indeed. <laughs> I, I, I had a character in mind that I, I set out. He, he is a friend of the family. He teams up with the young Molly Hargreaves. And um, I couldn't decide whether he was going to be a good guy or a bad guy. And that, that he, he grew on me. And, and at other times I thought, you know, I'm going to make him a bit of a drunkard. I'm going to make him a bit deceitful. And and that's how he ended up, because that's often how some people are. You know, he he ended up in conflict because he was a bit of a cad. He was a bit of a character. But in spending time with Molly and her pursuit in the truth, he ca he sort of comes good in the end. So, you know, I, I agree. Uh, I agree very much. So characters take on their they're, they're a real life. They 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 go where they want to go. Sometimes, you know, that's it. Absolutely, Joanne. I must ask you. You're writing in a, a genre that you kind of know from the sign over your head that they have to live happily ever after. Which, <laughs> that's the promise. <laughs> which, which, which I am very grateful for. I am very very <laughs> grateful that you you have that promise. Um, does that? tie you up shall we say when you're writing or you know does does it free you well how does that work out as a writer yeah I've never thought twice about that because I want that so much um, <laughs> it, the premise is important to me personally when I'm reading I read widely I read lots of things besides romance but I know when I go to romance that's what I'm looking for so I have never felt that that's hampering in any way but you know, to the point about characters surprising you and, and villains and things, the, the nice thing about writing series of romance is that characters who play the role of the villain in an earlier story can absolutely be redeemed in a later book and they will be the hero. Um, and you know, sometimes what looks on the outside as villainous or, or served a villainous role, you know, that character, the villain character might have been on a track and a path where you know, they, they had no choice. This is, you know, this is what happened to them. They had a hard day, a bad day, a, you know, an immature moment, who knows? There, there's a, a million reasons, but I think it's interesting to pick apart those characters to see what makes them tick. Why did they behave that way? Why was that in character? Was it out of character? Can they change? What, what would the trigger be to legitimately change a character like that and make them have different choices? And, and I think that's all, those things are great uh, breeding ground for growth um, in a later story. So sometimes the most flawed characters are the ones that make the most interesting heroes because their their journey is going to be something else. There, there is a lot that they have to overcome. And that, as a writer, that's fun to kind of dig into. I, I'm now imagining, because all writers talk about how their characters, you know, they're speaking to them in their head, they're driving, they're trying to sleep. Okay, you have 95 books worth of characters that often interact. I, do you sleep ever? <laughs> <laughs> or are they talking to you at all times? <laughs> they're talking all the time. They're, you know, but I think for people who are um, highly imaginative and creative, I don't think that would be any surprise. I, you know, we, we all hear characters in our heads constantly, um, you know, voices, other ideas, other choices you could make. Um, that's just kind of a part, I think, of a, a creative person's psyche. I just listen to it a lot more than maybe some people do. Fantastic. Yes, we all have characters that talk to us. Kevin even has statues that talk to him. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> I had a question for the three of you, because the three of you have written more than I have. Um, have you 
ever had a day where you wake up and so, like literally the moment you wake up, something clicks about a story. And you're like, yes, that's what I'm going to do. Or yes, that's what that meant. Like that's something you had previously written all and you're like, sounds like a good plot line, but, and then you wake up the next day and you're like, holy crap, that's it. Has that ever happened to you guys? It might be only one. It happened to you on that 5,000 word day, Anthony. It happened to you. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it, re regularly for me, I, yeah. and usually at four o'clock in the morning, yep. and, uh, I, it'll wake me up and, and something's in my head and I have to go downstairs, get on the computer and start writing. That happens regularly. Yeah. yeah. But I like it. I mean, I, I did, I, as a police officer for 25 years, I did a lot of short shift work. So I work nights and earlies and those sorts of things. Yeah. So it doesn't bother me being up at that, you know, yeah, odd I'm, an, I'm an eight old. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I love that. I love the excitement. You know, I can't type quick enough when the idea is flowing. And, and sometimes I find I'm sitting there frowning or smiling, depending what, what I'm writing. It, and, and, and even now with this, with Stone Child, the, I can pick it up and open it and it'll, it'll have a, an emotional effect on me. You know, and I know the story, I know it well, yeah, but it yeah. still has an effect on me. And I, and I love that. I love that about being a writer, the emotional effect that the writing has. All right, I just want to make sure that was like a normal thing that, I was, that, that was happening to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I would say, you know, for me, that phenomenon is so real. I actively try to go to sleep frequently thinking yes. about my characters and thinking about a pro plot problem and it's my message to my subconscious like hey work on this while i'm sleeping <laughs> get going I, oh, because okay, so sometimes yeah, i think your conscious same. mind can't it's too clouded it's too messy you don't know but when you're asleep i, I think your brain will work on some problems like that and and that's how that happens yeah. i think that you yeah. just wake up with that idea some you have to um have the time where you're not actively thinking about it to let the the deeper ideas um sort of come to the front all right that's yeah. that's good yeah because that's that's it, it happened to one of the biggest there's like two big plot twists in the story one of them came literally as i was writing it changed as in my head as i was going i was like oh we'll go in this direction we'll go in this direction and the other one literally i woke up one day i'm like oh i don't want to give it away but i was like oh that's right they yeah. are beautiful you know um i've actually gotten to the point where i'm I, we all have our phones with us all the time um and i have a a, a note-taking app on my phone so when i get like you said before um you know you get an idea from just talking to people just everyday life just kind of sparks an idea um there are times when i'm sitting there and i, I get an idea and my wife is like what's the matter like like she sees me go blank and she sees the graph of my phone she's like everything okay i'm like hold on before i forget so i just type it down and i put it in my notes to come back to it whether it's either something i have to research or an idea for, for a story that i'm working on and um i think that some of those some, to me so far those have been some of the most exciting moments because it's it's like oh now i have something else to work with um but good to see that i'm not the only one that has these, these yeah. weird moments i i needed um a cryptic clue a sort of dan brown cryptic clue for molly to solve which is how she solves the problem of the invasion of the statues and and it suddenly came to me and it needed to be a cryptic clue with the solution that was the solution in the book for for the for the character and it came to me one day and i was so excited i mean it just was a gift and but i couldn't tell anyone because it would have been a complete spoiler. Right, right. <laughs> and, I, and I had to carry that around with me, for, I don't know, for about a year before the book was oh. published. Not fair. And yeah. I mean, it really was difficult. You know, I kept yeah. kind of hinting it, hinted it and see if people would guess at it. And, and I, I really had to keep it a secret. And uh, yeah, yeah that's, that was brilliant. But when it yeah, came that was, out, yeah. it was, that was it tough. That was tough for me too because my wife is my editor. She's she's the one that reads <laughs> read everything I read. So um, and she was she was awesome at it. She she caught a couple of number of mistakes that I made. Um, but more importantly, she was kind of like my sounding board. And the best part about it is my wife is not really a sci-fi fan per se. She loves a great story in a number of different genres, but she's not, so she wasn't really hooked as a, as a fan. She was just kind of objectively reading, but I would come up with something like that and I couldn't tell her because I didn't want to ruin it for her when she read it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I couldn't, there was a couple of small details I could share with her, but um, I didn't want her to know right now, uh, I'm, I'm 30, 35,000 words into the, into the next book. Um, she hasn't seen anything yet, you know, cause right. I want her to, this, this, I, there's even more surprises, you know? So, um, it's kind of tough. Cause usually a lot of people like you share that certain, I, she's my editor and I want her to read it, um, as 
anybody else would read it and hopefully, you know, be able to enjoy it. And give, it was her idea to turn this into a series. Like initially it was a short story. Then an author convinced me to do it as a full length novel. By the time she read it, she was like, I see this being at least three to four books. I'm like, oh, okay. We'll, well put the other idea. I have, I have ideas for the next 18 books. I had to put those on the shelf. And I'm like, all right, let's, let's keep working with this. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, yeah, having to hold on to that, not being able to tell anything is, um, it, it, it can be kind of torture. Right, you know? right. But well, my, my wife has read it, my son has read it, they loved it, but they loved it because they didn't know what was coming. So, well, so we have to keep tell, those tell us what's coming just with what is your next book? Kevin, you said you have a, a follow up to Stone Child that's taking place here in New York. Is that true? That, that, that's correct, yes. And, and it, we're, we're five years on now. So, Molly, instead of being 15, she'll be in her early 20s. Uh, I'm looking for her to be in a romance. I've never written romance. I might be have to give you a call, Joanne. <laughs> and, um, I've never written romance, but she needs to be in a romance with an American boy and uh, or young man. And uh, and 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 she, there'll be a catch up on how her life has changed. You know, she had a, a major influence in saving London, in fact, from the statues. Okay. And uh, the effect that that's had on her life, the uh, it involves her parents and her family and those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, I'm All I'm right. early stages and seeing where it takes me. Fantastic. Now, Anthony, book two is it still the Revolutionary War, or do we move to another war? We moved on. There's actually there's three timelines in the third story. Okay. Um, uh, there's a timeline in Venezuela for the liberation of Latin America with okay. Simón Bolívar. Um, there is a storyline that begins in Legacy uh, that is continued as the main part of book two, which is a there's an operative named Marcus who, when the machine went down, um, was stranded in Rome um, during, in the year of 439 BCE. Mm -hmm. um, and so he stuck there. So uh, someone has got to come and get him. So there's an entire team that's sent out and um, good bulk of the story takes place um, during that time of the Roman Empire. And then of course, there's the there's all the uh, political intrigue and, and, and stuff of, um, uh, there was a plot and legacy to try to bring down the dominion and that story continues in this one. So there's actually three different stories being told simultaneously wow. in the story. Fantastic. Put it, put on your seatbelts. And Joanne, what is next coming off of your pen? I have a few things. My uh, nine month temptation that we talked about is the first book in the Brooklyn Night series. And I'm following it up with two others because of course I have to tell the roommate stories. All right. Uh, we get to know them a little bit in book one. And I hope I drop some you know fun and intriguing clues about their characters. And, and I hope that readers will want to read uh, what the girlfriends are up to in their next stories. And in September, I have Ways to Tempt the Boss, and the heroine is pursuing a career in makeup. And the November third book in the trilogy is The Stakes of Faking It, and it is an actress heroine. Um, and I'm just really excited about the series. It was fun writing a trilogy. I had done a couple of really long series, uh, nine books, um, six or seven books, and so to do a, you know, kind of really tightly plotted trilogy was something fun and different. It is nice writing often um, to kind of go back and forth between, um, between tropes, between length of series, between, you know, length of book. And, and sometimes it's fun even to write like when I was bouncing back and forth between historicals and contemporaries. I think it keeps writing fresh to move around a little bit between types of projects. Um, but this that was particularly fun for me to do a, just a real sharp kind of trilogy for the Brooklyn Night series. Fantastic. And let me remind all of our viewers of your books and where they can find more. Um, Kel Kevin Albin's Stone Child, and you can visit his website to get uh, notices when the next one is gonna come out so that you are all ready. Um, Anthony Tinelli wrote Legacy Book One of the Dominion series, and you got a little sneak preview also in what Book Two is going to hold, and I'm sure there's going to be more after that. And then certainly, if you are a lover of Happily Ever After as I am, please visit joannerock.com, Nine Month Temptation, plus 
the other books to find out what happened to the roommates. And there are plenty of other series out there to uh, wet your whistle and, and get your happily ever after on. I can't thank the three of you enough for joining me, not just so that I got to, you know, read more books, but so that our viewers um, can read more books and also get some uh, inspiration into their own writing. So please, when you're in New York, visit me here on the set. I'll have the wine chilling. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. And thank all you. of you, happy yeah. writing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Between the Covers. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're an author who would be interested in appearing on our show, or perhaps you're a member of a book club, we do host book clubs as well, please visit BetweenTheCoversTV.com. By the way, at BetweenTheCoversTV.com, you can watch past episodes in addition to learning more about our authors and guests. So sign up there if you would like to be a guest on the show yourself. And if you have some books that you would like to get written or published, visit redpenguinbooks.com. Thanks so much for joining us.